Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the fifth webcast in the series on the Autodesk Product Design and Manufacturing Collection. Jim Swain will be presenting on buckling analysis in Inventor and NASTRAN in CAD today for us. So throughout the presentation, please feel free to type in any questions you have in the question and answer panel, and we will get to those at the end of the webcast for as many as we have time for. Um, if there's any problems with the audio or anything like that, please type that in as well, and we will address that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim. All right. Well, thank you, Ellen. So today we're going to take a look at what we can well, what we can see as far as buckling goes. Uh, again, taking a step back, this seminar series originally started with the title of Designing Smarter. And I must say that buckling is something that in my product design world, my experience, I never really had the tools to work with. And I just assumed then we're going to over design and move from there and didn't really worry about it. Now, I've got a friend who's a structural engineer who um, chided me very heavily on that and said, no, Jim, sorry, compressive loads, there's so much more uh, that you have to worry about than you do tensile loads. And I kind of looked at him and said, okay, apparently we're coming from two different worlds because tensile uh, stress was my life. So uh, this is an area that really I had ignored just out of necessity. Again, I didn't really have the tools to look at it, so I didn't. Well, let's get into the intro and then we'll get into what we can look at now. So as usual, I'm Jim Swain, Applications Consultant here at Synergist Technologies. In previous lives, I've been a design engineer, again in the product design world, consumer electronics, heavy duty trucks, CAD manager in both those worlds as well. Uh, I got some degrees in mechanical engineering, but I'm not a professional engineer. And today, and for the next seminar, I want to point out I'm also not a structural engineer. Again, product design is where I lived before I came to Synergis, and so that really uh, colors the way I have approached uh, simulation. Also, as usual, anything that I cover in this class is for informational purposes only, should not be construed as design advice. Um, so it just accepts no legal responsibility for anything that you do based on what I say here. Basically, uh, this is not a design critique form. Okay, legal disclaimer, disclaimer aside. Okay, so what is buckling analysis? And I probably could have left the FEA out of this because what is buckling? So I look at Buckling is a tool to determine the potential collapse of design when subjected to the application of a compressive load or loads. So you're going to push on something, is it going to give way? I probably should have used that for the uh, shorter version. So basically, how likely is my design in a given operating condition going to be to collapse? And here is a place where I'm taking a step away. This is not a material failure. I have yet to do any type of design where I had to worry about material giving way just out of pure compressive stresses. I had material that would flow over time and we removed that from the design very quickly that I was working on. We've had material gall in case where we had relative motions and that was a compressive load induced failure. But what we're talking about here is not something that is just a material property. It's a geometry type of setup. So how does this actually help us to, uh, to design smarter? Well, again, whatever we're designing is intended to be used in the real world. If it only existed in the CAD world, it was only in the gaming world, life would be so much easier for a design engineer. But structures can become unstable long, long before the material is in danger of failing due to compressive loads. So in this case, we're going to be talking specifically about beams and plates. Well, today we're going to be talking about plates. Uh, you might recall that the next session we're going to be talking about frame design. 
and what tools we have for that, frame analysis also in Inventor, and then Nastran in CAD. And we'll take a, a look at a, uh, a buckling under those circumstances for some kind of truss. So today, we're looking specifically what Nastran brings to the table. Just like last time when we were talking about thermal, this one's a real short list. I don't have anything for buckling in Inventor. In fact, in Inventor, you're typically going to be comfortable just looking at the von Mises stress, which won't even show a negative value. Don't really know that whether uh, von Mises or von Mises, whichever way you want to pronounce it, is talking about a compressive or a tensile load. It is a measure of the energy stored in, a, uh, in an element. Nastran, however, does have it. So again, this is a first. This is something that I may or may not have used in uh, previous design places, but I would have liked to have the option. We did do some uh, looking at uh, pieces that 2020 hindsight, we probably should have looked at buckling as well. So here's what we've got. We've got a linear buckling as highlighted there on the right hand side. There's also a nonlinear buckling. So linear buckling, wow, that was a really useful slide, wasn't it? So linear buckling, we'll go into that one specifically today. Uh, things such as uh, what's commonly called Euler buckling, uh, buckling due to uh, an assumed uh, uh, off or eccentric, yeah, that's probably the right word, eccentric loading of something like a column, or as we'll see today, a, a dome. Uh, and it just goes with some classic theory and working from there. Nonlinear buckling, it will take a look at how the uh, how the structure is deforming and recalculate and see what kind of load shifts are going on from there, do another analysis, recalculate based on the new deformation, so on and so on, as well as nonlinear materials. But the nonlinear buckling is going to take a look at the geometric uh, changes that would uh, make the buckling take place easier. So let's take a look at this. First of all, you can use it for parts, sorry, assemblies. Somehow, yeah, parts and assemblies, sorry. A bit of a brain fade there. Uh, in fact, the one I'm going to show here is definitely a part. It's a, a dome that's going to go through an oil can type of uh, deformation. For the linear buckling, you start with a static analysis. And I'll show you that it's going to come into play. I do have an example in the background that I will then bring up once we get through this. But it's got all the loads and constraints that go along with a basic static analysis. That's what starts off your buckling. So first of all, uh, just as an aside, run a static analysis first. Make sure that you don't have any unexpected results. Do a, use this as a sanity check. Are things behaving the way you want and then kick into the buckling. The results for the linear buckling then are used to develop what's called an eigenvalue. And if you've never heard of it before, let's take a step back and realize that what we're doing is building a mesh that's representing our physical parts. So we're simulating a physical part with a mesh. The mesh is used to generate a huge matrix of equations that tie different points together that make up the mesh with the springs that represent the material properties of the physical models. Well, a matrix has a mathematical um, uh, derivation. I don't know, that might be the right word for it. That's known as an eigenvalue. It's basically a solution to different equations that a matrix can have. And that's what you're getting out of on the linear buckling. You use that then as a force multiplier. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So for right now, let's just say that you're going to run a static analysis, do a sanity check on those results, and then use the uh, eigenvalue to see just where you might get uh, buckling taking place. Nonlinear analysis, as I said, that's going to start taking a look at not only the nonlinear properties of a material itself, but also, as the piece deforms, how does that deformation change the way the loading is affecting the, uh, the structure? 
if it bends out, if it bows out, it's going to keep bowing more and more. It's another way of thinking of it. All right, I already said those two. So let's take a look. Here's the uh, analysis I was talking about, and this is just the mesh applied to it. This is a plate. It's a uh, dome like you might find on the end of a cylinder. Uh, this is the mesh that was applied to it. Fairly uniform, nice. Uh, you can see in some areas we've got some kind of small triangles and stuff. And I got warned about those when I ran the analysis, but it still ran fine. From there, I ran the uh, initial stress. And yes, that's just the name of the subcase. It originally starts with the beautiful name of subcase one, which is not real descriptive and just doesn't sound good during a PowerPoint presentation. So that's renamed into that. It wasn't the software giving a magic name. And as a sanity check, there is the shape that's going to that the dome is going to go through when it's a uh, essentially a vacuum. A negative pressure was applied uh, to it. So picture that the rim of this dome. Let me just go back a step if the uh, if I can convince uh, PowerPoint to behave. Uh, this is not going to work quite as smooth as I like, but I'll just ignore it. So there we go. So picture this where it's uh, supported all the way around uh, that rim, the underside of the rim as we're looking at it there. And then a pressure is uh, applied to it, uh, sucking a vacuum from the inside. Uh, I realize I'm showing my age when I say it, but we always refer to this as oil canning, where you have something like a uh, soda can and the dome on the underside would all of a sudden pop through to be Forcing, uh, facing the other direction. And the static analysis with that load, yeah, I can picture that everything is behaving the way I expected. I don't have any uh, things bending out of place. I've got a nice uniform constraint around the rim. That's what I was getting at there. And nothing's uh, shaped very strangely as far as the results go. It's a nice uh, result for a sanity check. But that's also used as the input for the uh, eigenvalue solution. So that stress uh, didn't really show up on the other side, but that stress was put on with a nice value of one PSI. So I've got a nice initial value there. And now the second uh, subcase, which again I renamed to linear buckling case, uh, the solution there comes up with, I asked for three nodes sorry, three modes, say it right. And I come up with three values right around 1300, just a little bit over 1300. And why I interpret those results is that buckling is likely to occur at about 1300 times whatever my initial load was. And since my initial load was one PSI, about 1300 uh, PSI of vacuum would probably cause this to buckle in. Now, it's a little bit of an, I'd say, conservative uh, viewpoint. It might buckle before then. This is a perfect case. Remember, simulations are that. They're a simulation of the real world. It's got a nice uniform thickness. There's no thin uh, sections on this dome because of any manufacturing. There's no uh, material imperfections. Nothing that would give a reason for a stress concentration and for the oil canning to take place earlier. This is a perfect scenario. Another way of looking at it, I might look at this and say, yep, all right, anything over this, I'm going to expect it to buckle. Might happen before this, but definitely anything over this. So I know I'm going through the slide deck pretty quickly today because there really aren't that, that many slides, but I will kick over to Nastran and CAD show you where I am on that and honestly I'll probably rerun the simulation because it does go very quickly. So what to use? The moment my only choice is Nastran and NCAT. We will talk about Fusion coming up. I've got that scheduled for the Friday before New Year's. Yes I'm working that day anyway so if you're stuck in the office and you need an excuse to sit back and watch a webinar for an hour or so please feel free to join me ask questions so on, but we'll take a look at the range of simulation products available in Fusion at that point. So I said that was a fast forward through there. I'm going to take a quick look at the chart and see if there are any questions. I'm not seeing any at the moment, so let me kick over to 
inventor. There we go. So hopefully that's showing up okay on the screen. And let's see, bear with me just a moment here. All right, I need to get the uh, webinar screen off of my area. Okay, so as I said, what I did on this is did a combination of two subcases, one for the basic static loading and that load itself, one PSI. You can see the value popping up there in the browser. And uh, the loading, when I first came on it, there we go. You can see how it's uniformly applied to all the surfaces, except for those that are actually constrained, because there really wasn't any point in hitting that. And speaking of constraints, as I said, the uh, constraints are around that bottom lip. A nice fixed area. So the, I'm saying that that wasn't allowed to move at all. Wasn't even allowed to slide. Then for the second load case, the, I'm sorry, second subcase, no load, same constraints, and then the analysis is run. Uh, let me kick up to the results that I ran from this morning, just so you can see what's going on. Then I will rerun it because it's pretty impressive how fast this runs for this uh, size model, which uh, I'll have to go back and take a look at what the mesh size is. So for the stresses, Take a look, uh, just basic stress results. Let's say von Mises. And there's the results. Again, saw those before. We've got a uh, very low stress area, high bending in, in that, and then uh, some medium there right at the tip of this. More importantly, though, what's going on with these eigenvalues? When I ran this analysis, specifically asked for three modes. And what you're going to see in the differences between the three is just a different form of the buckling here. It's uh, three peaks, three valleys. Kick over to the next eigenvalue. Very, very close. It's three. And you notice how they're kind of a mirror image of where the uh, others were. And then finally, a, a two mode, sorry, two node uh, buckling. So they're all real close to each other. So to me, any one of those is likely. This could be a uh, some kind of uh, pressure vessel where I would probably have used this in previous life, honestly, as a dome switch like you have on the backside of a keyboard, things along those lines. And the manufacturers give you all the results, but yeah, we always like having the ability to double check things and then see what kind of forces uh, are going back through whatever mechanism is operating that dome switch. So. Just so you can see what I mean by the speed of this, this particular analysis, if I take a look at it, oh, here, we'll just go ahead and regenerate the mesh. It's nice and small uh, size here. I wouldn't do this if I didn't know it was only going to take a moment or two. Here you can see, uh, uh, oh, that's right, I'm thinking of the inventor where it just pops right up as far as the number of elements. There we go. Number of elements here, about 5,500, 5,600. Nice small, for, not bad for a single part. If I now go and run it, it's going to kick up. It's going to build the, the basic uh, Nastrand X, it's called. It's going to give me some warnings because I've got some very skinny triangular elements through here. Subcase one is being solved. It's going to then take the results of that and use that to calculate the eigenvalues. I will say I know that I'm oversimplifying the uh, mathematics that are going into this buckling. Again, as I've said before, I'm approaching this as a design engineer. Uh, that's where I've spent my life, and I like using these tools to make my life as design engineer better. Uh, if this was a critical part on an airplane, I would definitely be handing to somebody after I get it close to where I want uh, simulation, or sorry, the um, design to be 
for verification while I continue with the rest of my design. I'd be doing this quick and early from a concept point of view so that I can have some confidence that I can continue my design while I then have somebody who knows better go on out. I didn't have to talk very long for that to, uh, to finish up. So give you an idea for a 5,600 count piece minute or two and I will not say that I have a fast machine so give you a feel for where this is with that being said again uh, well I'll stick on on the line for a few minutes afterwards and see if there are any questions or uh, you can find my contact information on the uh, Synergist website but I'd like to point out that this is number five and coming up We've got two currently scheduled. On the 22nd, we're going to take a look at uh, frame analysis. Again, something that in uh, my world I didn't pay a lot of attention to because it was just more trouble than it was worth. Well, I've got tools both in Inventor and in Nastran. In fact, there's uh, tools to go back and forth between the two that uh, I can now take advantage of. And I think I'm going to have, be able to have time to sneak fatigue in there. I noticed I hadn't brought that the, up as a topic for this series, and it's something that Nastran does offer us. So I wanted to be able to at least talk a bit about it and what your capabilities are. Again, it's something we used to do via hand calculation because that's all we had. And it was something that was necessary for uh, the type of work I was in. Now I do have some tools to use for quicker analysis um, and then sanity check it with my own stuff and reduce the amount of fatigue testing required because that was probably the longest part of the development cycle at both of my previous jobs is the long-term durability testing. At least here I can go through and get a feel for the likelihood of success early on and make changes if I need to at that point. In addition to that of course we offer training classes in vendor simulation Again, nothing for buckling, so you're out of luck as far as that goes. Nastran NCAT, yes, definitely. And we do cover uh, the process of going through and doing the buckling in this analysis. In fact, uh, we use that oil can, we use a small truss. Take a look at both of those. And then Fusion 360 simulation, that class, um, will be scheduled for next year. We don't have that on the books yet. We're still trying to figure out what's the uh, appropriate amount of time to allow for that. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Also, I haven't updated this uh, slide for a little bit, but there are recordings both of these seminars or webinars and also some mold flow for those of you that are working in plastic injection molds. Uh, Inventor does have some great tools in there. And then there are some uh, videos also out there that I put up for uh, simplifying your designs leading into simulation. Uh, so if those are useful, go and check those out. With that, I've hit pretty much what I was targeting as far as my uh, time for this one. And it doesn't look like either you folks are out there playing solitaire or uh, uh, able to get something useful out of this, but I don't see any questions. Ellen? No, nope, there's no question you know? pending. Um, and I just wanted to let the folks on the line know that we will be sending you a link to the recording of this webcast. And on our YouTube channel, you'll find all the recordings that Jim had mentioned. So please feel free to um, look there for them as well. Also, Ellen, is this an appropriate moment to make a plug for December 19th? Sure. All right. That was a very short plug for December 19th. We're going to be having a manufacturing event here in, at our Quaker Town office. Uh, if you're looking at this on YouTube in the next three years, that's December 19th of 2017, and you missed it. But for those of you that are live now, uh, we'll be getting emails out to invite folks. Or if you are interested and you want to email me directly, feel free. I'll, I'll get that out to you uh, as time permits next week. Uh, but we're going to show off our facility, but also just have some, I'll call it semi-formal, but also informal discussions as far as uh, CAD and what it can do to help you and what we can do to help you with CAD. So, uh, Ellen, that's it for me. Right, and just on the 19th, the um, 
to if you're putting a save the date in your calendar, it's going to be from 4 to 7 p.m. With that, okay. thank you, Jim, and thank you everyone for attending today, and have a great weekend.